going to hand over to Simon Gibson, our Chief Investment Officer, who will walk you through the programme for today and I will rejoin you at the end for the question and answer session. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very much, Joe, and uh, likewise from me, a warm welcome to everybody who's joining us today. We have many clients, uh, some of our professional connections and also some guests today. Many of you are joining us for the fifth month in a row, and it's very nice to see everybody. To give you a quick Mattioli Woods update, uh, we continue to operate a full service. We're not quite in the level of lockdown that we were when we started these events, but nevertheless, the pandemic uh, is still, of course, uh, going on around the globe. And our business is benefiting from having had a sound operational uh, background and indeed a, a plan. The map shows not uh, a government list of lockdown cities, but in fact our various office locations. And we're delighted to have people really from all of those locations and plenty of places in between joining us today. And so again, you're all very welcome. Today we are going to talk about a theme of next normal. We want to talk about this because a lot of people are talking about the new normal, what's happened because of the pandemic. Uh, nevertheless, we always do and we always will look ahead. And hence, we think about the next normal by necessity, because we think things, whilst some will stay the same, have undoubtedly changed. Because we think there will be a, a need for new and indeed more energy, uh, that life and economies are undoubtedly at a crossroads right now, and time is being valued differently to just a few months ago. We think growth will be more nuanced than ever. Uh, offices may become a thing of the past and the use of robotics and other technology will undoubtedly supplement economics, economic growth and economies. Money, certainly cash in the form of physical cash will probably cease to exist quicker. And all of this backs up uh, what was said in a call I was on with the Bank of England governor and deputies on Friday that the change that's already been underway for many trends is really accelerating and we will also have to be more adaptable and all of this is because this is what life does it's happened before it will happen again we just really want to highlight that we're conscious of what's going on right now so finally and before i introduce our first speaker bob woods who is going to help to set some context for us on all of this i would just like to say that this is no time for nostalgia we don't live in the past anymore. It's important to learn from history, of course, but when we were taking our driving test, and indeed when those of us that have passed are driving, aren't we surely better looking through the windscreen rather than the rear view mirror? Uh, we should cast our eyes back to history, but we really should be concentrating on the future. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Bob Woods. Bob is founder and senior advisor at Mattioli Woods, they're his official titles. I also like to think of him as a thinker, and he's going to be covering, amongst other things, growth, debt, and climate change. So, with Back to the Future, I'll pass you on to Bob. Thank you very much, Simon, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, this, web this webinar is just to have a, a forward look at what the uh, world might um, confront us with um, post-pandemic. And of course, it, it, it is really to look at uh, what the impact of the pandemic might have on our future. And, um, but before we, before we go there, I'd like to transport you back 100 years, because I think it's always worthwhile looking back, sometimes in the rear view mirror, before we look through the, through the, the windscreen. Um, and I'd like to take you back to the time of the Spanish flu. Because um, then 1918, when it first struck, and it didn't die out until 1920, so it lasted two years. Um, at that time, the world population was around about one and a half billion. And nobody knows for sure, um, but it's thought that at least a third of the world's population were infected. And it may well have been more than half. And nobody knows how many people died, um, but estimates vary between 20 and 100 million. And to put that into a modern context, with the world population close to 8 billion, that would be like 4 billion people being infected and maybe 150 million people losing their lives. And that's roughly double uh, the number of lives lost in the whole of the Second World War. So you can imagine the, the, the enormous fear um, that would have triggered in the aftermath of the, the awful four years on the front and, and the trench warfare that killed so many people as well. Um, 
So, so what happened uh, at the end of that uh, pandemic? Well, of course, the, um, it, it only petered out for one of two reasons. Either the virus itself mutated, um, which is probably unlikely that quickly because it li literally was history by 1920, or more likely, it created a brutal herd immunity. And I call it a brutal herd immunity because obviously so many people died. So, so what then followed? And of course, the 1920s was called the Roaring Twenties. And it was a time of um, economic uh, growth, uh, a renaissance in society. And I'm not suggesting for a minute that we're about to see a, a new Roaring Twenties by any means. So let's start by having a look at um, where the world sits or sat just before the pandemic. So what you can see on the screen here is an expression of the globe by a uh, country's percentage of global GDP. And I won't ask you to add up all of the little slices, but I can tell you that very approximately half the world economy is now uh, the West and the other half is the East. But if you went back maybe a generation or more, um, it would be 80-20 in favour of the West. And so what that really tells us is that the tide has gone out for the West and it's come in for the East. And that shift of economic power from West to East has created enormous change in all of our lives. In the UK, um, before that happened, manufacturing was the engine room of the UK economy. It employed a third of the world's, uh, third of the UK's workforce. And so much changed. We developed a, a service-led economy in the 80s, supported by credit fuel consumerism and growth in public sector. So it brought enormous change in our lives. But if you ask somebody now what their perception of the global economy is, they'll tell you, well, of course, it's been growing powerfully for many years now. And that is, of course, true. But actually, there's another story that if you look over the last 50 years, growth rate in the global economy has been on a gentle decline. And there are a number of reasons for that. I mean, first and most obviously, when something becomes very large or the larger it becomes, the more difficult it is to maintain that growth rate. But apart from that very obvious fact, I think there are the three other factors, uh, which I call debt, demographics and dictators. And those, those three factors are still very much alive today. So um, if you go back to the 80s, there was very, very limited credit uh, for consumers in the UK. Uh, the government had spent um, 50 years uh, and more uh, bringing down the debt from the Second World War, which had reached a peak of about 180% of UK GDP. And uh, it re remained well below 50% uh, from around about the 70s right through to the credit crisis. But of course, the credit crisis then created a, a very large spike as, by, as the government had to borrow in order to fund the enormous quantitative easing programs. And then we saw government debt in the UK jump from sub 50% to nearly 90%. And of course, we're going through the same thing again, as the government has to borrow enormous amounts of money to help uh, resolve the, the economic outcome and the fallout of the pandemic. And it's quite likely that government debt will end up um, north of 125% of GDP. So the message here is quite simple. If an economy has low levels of debt, um, releasing debt can actually act as a catalyst to economic growth. When debt levels are very, very high, it will have the converse effect. So let's have a look at demographics. In 1960, the world's population was 3 billion people, and it's now 7.8 billion people. And our species has been around for 400,000 years. So what's happened in the last 60 to 70 years is quite phenomenal. And of course, it created an enormous amount of economic activity. But population growth is now slowing on every continent except Africa. And that slowdown is also slowing economic growth. And that's actually exacerbated by two further factors. The ratio of working age people to retired people is changing in the wrong direction. And the numbers alone um, just create other challenges, not least of which is climate change. If there were less people on the planet, there'd be less CO2 in the atmosphere. And I'm certainly not advocating that as a solution to climate change. And then finally, if we look at dictators, we've lived through a world of globalization and globalization has been hailed as a good thing. What it really means, it's the internationalization of business activity. Is companies trading more across borders than within their own borders. And perhaps the main benefactor has been China and perhaps increasingly India. China has become to be called the world's manufacturer. But in so doing, it's taken away enormous amounts of manufacturing from other parts of the world, mainly in the West. And that's enabled a, a president such as Donald Trump to be elected.
because his banner is to become protectionist and to protect the US economy. And in so doing, he started the trade war in 2018. And again, something that will dampen down economic growth. <clears throat> so what will be the post-pandemic trends? And I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, um, but the West to East drift may actually slow down as uh, the West decides that they don't want to be quite so reliant upon the China. But high street weakness won't slow down. Home working won't slow down. And we may well have a weaker housing market on the back of rising unemployment. And geopolitical tensions are probably going to get worse, not better. So what does that mean for the investment outlook? Well, I believe that mainstream markets will struggle against the backdrop of uh, enduring weak economic growth. I think negative interest rates, something that five or 10 years ago we thought was just ridiculous, may become a normal part of debt markets as central banks and governments uh, desperately try to ensure that interest rates remain low. Because if we lose control of interest rates, it's probably game over. But in a world of ra such rapid technological change, there'll be all sorts of opportunities, not least of which in technology, but also healthcare, infrastructure and sustainability. And I'd like to spend the last couple of minutes of my presentation just talking about climate change and sustainability. This screen shows the famous Keeling curve. It's the most well-known uh, graph showing the increase in CO2 levels. Now, as you, as you probably know, we know a lot about CO2 levels over hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years through the study of ice cores, which traps CO2. And over that immensely long period, uh, we believe that CO2 levels never fell outside a range of 185 parts per million to 320 parts per million. And over that enormous time period, we had glacial periods interspersed by relatively short warm eras, such as we're in now. But never have we seen CO2 levels rise as they have now, going way above the 320 level to now 417 parts per million. Now, it has to be said that if there were no greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the world would be a rather cold place. It'd be about 35 degrees colder. That means that the UK would have winters of typically minus 30, summers of minus 15. But that's not the case. We do have greenhouse gases. But as a, con as, as a consequence, in the last 40 years, Arctic sea ice has fallen by half. Sea levels since pre-industrial times have risen by 24 centimetres already. And the last few years have been the warmest on record. 2018, we had the global heat wave, which gave rise to wildfires all around the world, notably in Australia, uh, America, and also in places like Siberia, where you'd least expect it. And of course, nearly one billion people go to bed hungry every night. Now, the Paris Accord is wants to try to ensure that uh, global temperatures don't increase by more than one and a half percent above pre-industrial uh, levels by 2050. And current estimates indicate that if we can achieve that, uh, a 2018 heat wave with all the, the wildfires that we experienced will become probably a one in four event. But if we fail and it goes to 2%, it'll become every other year. If it goes to 3%, it'll be pretty well every year. So this is now becoming a really quite a serious issue. And it's my view that I do think now that governments will start to address this uh, much more seriously than ever before. Um, so before I, uh, so what I want to show you on this very last slide is the importance of embracing change. Now the American stock market has very significantly outperformed most other major Western markets, uh, notably Japan, Europe, and indeed ourselves. And they've done it because they, it's demonstrable that they have embraced change um, far more willingly. They have a much greater entrepreneurial culture. And you can see how the top 10 companies in, in America has changed dramatically over the last 100 years. There's been nothing like the same level of change in Europe and indeed the UK. The US market now stands at something like 35 trillion in market cap. Four companies account for 5 trillion of that. And it's not the same four as you can see on the screen in front of you, although two are. It's Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and Facebook. And who've seen their market shares, their market capitalization rocket just in the last three years, and indeed as a consequence of partly, partly as a consequence of the pandemic. So it's this screen is here to show how important it is to embrace change. At the start of the internet revolution some 20 years ago, America did, and we didn't to the same degree. But nonetheless, 
I'm really excited and believe that the world will get to grips with climate change, but I'm also excited that in so doing, it will, be, it will create truly wonderful investment opportunities to enhance our clients' wealth and at the same time protect our planet. So thank you very much for listening to me and I'll now pass back to Simon. Thank you very much indeed, Bob. Uh, it's, uh, it's really good to have uh, your insight combined with uh, that look back at, uh, at some of the important uh, factors of where we've been. I'd now like to introduce Tom Elliott, our senior investment strategist, to talk about the next normal. And I suppose the question, Tom, is will our investing lives ever be the same again? Good afternoon. Uh, a quick answer is no. Uh, and it really looks like the pandemic is accelerating uh, themes that were already in the, in the process of taking place. So over the next uh, 10 minutes, I'm going to explore uh, some of the disruptiveness that's taking place in our lives and, uh, and in economics and what that might mean for us. First thing is our relationship with the state may well change uh, quite considerably. We're going to be moving, I think, into what critics might call a nanny state or, or others a surveillance state, but it will mean the government uh, collects more data on us and uh, it, it offers that in return for security against pandemics and perhaps uh, often they will use the terrorist threat as well. But what this crisis has shown is that if you can do a preventative approach to health and build up resilience and capacity in your health service, instead of running it to maximum capacity as the norm, you can cope much better when a pandemic comes along. That's the lesson from Germany and South Korea. And I think the UK government is going to be taking that on board. And with that will come the need for more tax. And that will pay not only for medicine and health as we're used to seeing it, but also for preventative public health programs. And again, this comes back to the nanny state idea. We're seeing who would have believed if Boris Johnson talk about the need for sugar taxes and for the state to be involved in people's uh, diet more and that sort of thing. So we're gonna have to get used to that and, and, uh, and live with it. And I think we probably will. You know, track and trace may well become a normal app for us to carry around uh, even when we're no longer having pandemics, we may just get used to it. International relations are going to be interesting because many countries will have found, if you like, new friends and discovered enemies where they didn't think they had uh, in recent months over where they got their PP equipment from. Italy, for instance, suddenly found it was in receipt of uh, sales that uh, other countries couldn't get from China. Uh, well, that, that so that China can gain political ground in Italy. But there are many examples, and we're going to see this heightened when vaccines are invented as to who gets what, who gets the intellectual patents and, or sh is shared them in order to help make them, uh, who gets first dibs with the raw uh, ingredients that go into making them. So that's going to ex ex accelerate existing tensions in international relations. When it comes to the nationalist strongmen that, that Bob illustrated in, the, in his earlier slide, they generally haven't come out very well. They've, uh, they, they've tended not to be very open or in, uh, open about the cases they've got and not to encourage lockdowns. I mean, look at Bolsonaro, um, look at Trump. Uh, but what it has, and so in those countries, you tend to have seen high numbers of cases. But what is really interesting is it's been a fantastic time for conspiracy theories and these nationalist leaders thrive off conspiracy theories so we've got a mixed picture there when it comes to how our future lives will be this is really interesting for you and i uh, do we need to ever to go back into the office um, could i just stay at home for the rest of my working career um, uh, uh, not only that, but obviously then our, our, not only is office space, perhaps not necessary, but our ancillary services such as cleaners in offices necessary. What about pret a and other restaurants are available on the ground level? Are they necessary? And if not, what happens to the low paid casual student sort of staff that work in those? What, what happens to that 
segment of society's employment prospects? What will be the impact of family life? Uh, it, it, do we end up having better relationships with our kids because we're seeing them more at home? Or, or does one turn into a mini Herod, if you like, and, and you'd rather be away? Zoom is really interesting because if it's all very well working from home with Zoom, but what happens to the water office cooler conversations that spark an idea? If you're always having to book a call with somebody, does that spoil um, the initiative? Does, does it take the, the, do you reduce creativity and the speed with which one can be effective? And finally, do we need gym classes? Could those all be closed and we just do it over Zoom? An extension of that is education. Now, we'll always need primary and secondary schools because kids just won't uh, learn otherwise, um, arguably. But certainly when it comes to tertiary, could our universities effectively go all online? So this crisis, as I said, accentuates existing trends. And as many others have said, it's, uh, I think this actually came from the head of Apple, this particular quote, is, is Constantine at what, 10 years into six months, this crisis, in terms of tech development. Now, the economy will never be the same either. The days of the low single digit inflation interest rates appear to be gone. Most economists that you talk to now are veering between believing we're entering a Japan-like scenario of constantly low inflation and low growth, the Economist magazine ran an article, ran a cover story about two months ago called the 90% economy that's got 10% spare capacity as debt weighs on it, high unemployment, and that leads to deflation. And there's another group that take the opposite view and say, look, all this funny money that's being produced by um, central banks and government excess government borrowing is going to find its way into the real economy, is going to create inflation. You need to buy gold and uh, head to the hills with a shotgun and so on because there'll be rampant inflation. So there's a, a, a bifurcation, if you like, of views of the macroeconomic outlook and very few believe that uh, as a result, when we emerge from this crisis, we are going to be in the macroeconomic world we were before. Instead, they see extremes. Um, tech, is the first casualty of deglobalization. It's all in the news at the moment as Trump aims his guns at all the Chinese tech players. That could spread into other sectors. And we see a, 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 a reverse of the gains of globalization. The gains of globalization are cheaper products for you and I. If we have a reversal of that, and we have more local manufacturing, it means by definition, smaller number of units made, means higher unit costs and higher prices. Now, some might say, hey, that brings more jobs back to Leicester, wherever. Others might say, think of the consumer who has to pay more for the products. And is that really how we want society to go? There'll be more state intervention. Uh, it's not just the UK government, a Tory government. Uh, one of the justifications for leaving the EU was to do more state, in state spending on national champions, which is quite an eye opener. This is uh, for a, a, a right of centre UK government. The German government has gone with it with absolute gusto over the last four months or so um, in terms of uh, protecting national champions from being bought by China, uh, from going bust because of the COVID and so on. So that has become socially acceptable again after a 20 or 30 year hiatus. And taxes are going to increase. Who's going to pay? It, there's, it, it's not going to be the workers, it's not going to be the young. They got hit, certainly in the UK, during austerity. Instead, it's going to be those who benefited, I think, from the rise in asset prices that resulted from the quantitative easing of the financial crisis. And that is sort of my, my generation and older. It may well be a lot of the people who are watching this. Economics has changed. Magic money trees do exist. We are up to a deficit now, budget deficit of around 18%, up from about 4% at the beginning of the year. Money that has come from, by and large, uh, the bond market, uh, 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 not through raising taxes yet, that will come. There may come a time when the bond market says, actually, we fear inflation, we fear too much debt has been issued, we don't want to buy any more. 
fear not because there's a real funny money tree out there and it's called modern monetary theory if you like excess debt is the fiscal money tree that's been discovered modern monetary theory is the monetary money theory that's uh, uh funny money it's been discovered don't have time to go into it now you can look at it on google but it basically says why can't the government just go to the bank of england and say wait can you lend me lots of money and they say yes and you avoid issuing bonds that the bond market may not want you just build up a big overdraft with the bank of england you might say that can't happen it already does there's a ways and means account with the bank of england which is essentially that and it's growing very very quickly um and the cash is going to change it's not just because it's unhealthy it carries diseases but uh people like china love the idea of electronic cash rather than physical cash because they can keep tabs on people the swedes meanwhile which is one of those societies that's top of usage of electronic cash love it just because they love tech things but there is a debate in all these countries over whose electronic money do you use do you use private sector electronic money such as the libra being developed by Facebook. Uh, some central banks don't like that. They want to have control over their money. And so I suspect it's more likely to be central bank money that we actually see winning out, not uh, 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 private electronic money. And finally, this is just a look from one company that I'm giving as illustration on the futuristic products that are gonna be in stores near us. And it's a bit like looking at an edition of Tomorrow's World. This is just from Apple. And you can see, if you like, why we like tech stocks, because Apple is in the future is not just going to be about producing iPods and iPhones and all those. So we've got hardware that will enable wearables for your health to be not just for communications, sorry, for health and communication purposes will get better and better. Apple are designing their own bespoke chips. They're taking chips manufacturing from Intel, doing it themselves so that they can make their own bespoke chips to help produce really good products. This is similar to ge genomes being, uh, sorry, in genetics, individual genomes being traced so that individual medicines can be produced. You can get a lot more out of your software if you have bespoke chips. And this will lead to far more products that use less energy and are quicker. Uh, Project Titan self-driving cars. Apple and Alphabet and others are real challenges to the car industry here. It may be that what we see as tech now, in 10 years time, a sizable part of their income comes from automotive. Um, it, it, a study showed that driverless trucks would reduce the cost of trucks by 47%. That means cheaper goods in our stores, but it also means again the drivers will have a social group that uh, that they come from. Augmented reality, this is astonishing. If the world doesn't look pretty enough through your eyeglasses, you can have a virtual version done, and that can lead to so many things: instant communication um, through into your eye while you're driving, you're walking around. Uh, so that's really uh, this, this is tomorrow's world. But as I said, it's being uh compressed into a very short time and we at matty early woods we do like tech as an investable theme because it never ceases to surprise us where it's going and it sounds also plausible and if i'd just like to finish off with a positive view on tech so often you hear dystopian views of the future uh the uk economist roger bootle came out with a book last year the ai economy work wealth and welfare in the rubber age it's brilliant it's easy to read uh, it's not simple, but it's it, it's for the layman, and it's an optimistic view of how robotics will help us lead a better life in the future. And I I do recommend it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Tom. And uh, we do appreciate uh, your inputs there. Uh, just a quick reminder: if you would like to ask any of our panel questions, there is the opportunity to do so uh, on the right hand side of your screen. So acceleration has been mentioned a couple of times. I suppose I'd just like to start by posing a question. Why are markets so resilient? Well, in fact, of course, it isn't markets, it's investors. And we think that there are certain assumptions that are being made that are keeping markets where they are and driving some of them uh, even closer to new highs. Let's have a look at 
what those are before we look a bit more into the next normal. I think the first of those is around a vaccine. The next is that COVID-19 is manageable. The fiscal policy and stimulus are working. There's more to come if they don't. The US-China spat is just rhetoric. Europe is getting its act together. The crisis is temporary. And anyway, what's the alternative? Is there any alternative to, to, to equity? If we quickly revisit those, the, there's a vaccine coming. Maybe, but mind the gap between the end of stimulus, more in a second, and the vaccine. COVID-19 is manageable. Maybe, quite possibly, but, but maybe not. Fiscal policy and stimulus are working. Absolutely. So far, I completely agree with that. But we don't think that's actually a bottomless pit, despite that big overdraft that the government can draw on, that Tom has referred to. And there's more to come if they don't. So see my previous answer. US-China is rhetoric, I think, so far. But watch out for that to get quite nasty. I think that's uh, that's one of the biggest problems that people are underestimating outside of simply COVID-19. Europe is getting its act together. I agree with that. And I think we are pretty pleased to see the large stimulus agreed in, in the EU since we last spoke. And the crisis isn't temporary in any way. What's the alternative to equity? Well, maybe there's something to that. But um, let's have a look at the at the next normal. The first thing I'd like to talk about referencing something Bob spoke about is, is new energy, uh, climate change and the like. The graph here shows a gradual fall uh, from top left to, to bottom right, but from top left to where we are now with the arrow, uh, it is showing uh, the CO2 emissions since 1990. And the target, the bottom right hand side, the original target, I should say, uh, may seem a long way off, but we think it's deliverable. We need cleaner cheaper electricity and we need a lot more of it. This plays into the mega trend of health as well, but more of that later. The younger and generally more animated uh, in society, the activists, if you like, for climate change are really just the tip of a rapidly melting iceberg. So what's going on? How are we seeing these reductions, which have already been very positive all the way to 2020, as you can see? But there is acceleration. Well, the biggest liquid air battery in the world is being built just outside of Manchester. It's a pumped hydro system uh, and it will be roughly twice the size of the chemical battery that Tesla uh, have got in Australia, of which a lot of noise is made. Uh, Orsted, a Danish energy company, big into oil and gas only 10 years ago, had a look at the uh, energy market and decided they really ought to get into offshore wind. Their share price has gone up many, many times since. That offshore energy sector could well, according to some estimates, underpin 60% of that further reduction to help us hit those 2050 targets. And net greenhouse gas emissions are now the target, uh, zero, net zero, I should say. And that became law in the UK last year. So there will be continued government support for, for all of these sort of initiatives. Briefly, before I, I look at the next slide, we've also got to think about the cost of data storage. Uh, this is part of next normal. Uh, I used to be surrounded by files. Now I've got a laptop and the cloud has got all of our information in it. Uh, in the year 2000, one terabyte of data storage, which is quite a lot, cost you $17,000. Today, Amazon will sell you the same amount of storage for $3 and they're making money out of it. So investing will never be the same again. Let's quickly talk about the cashless society, um, the, the importance of cash uh, indeed, and balloons. Digital is indeed a major theme, and we think uh, that we all understand how important it is, but uh, trust me on this, we're really only at the start of this digital revolution. Payment systems are replacing cash. Think Visa rather than Wirecard from an investment perspective. Tom spoke about Sweden. Uh, they are very much into their tech to the extent that so far, at least 4,000 people have had a digital microchip implanted into the palm of their hand, which they can use as a tap and pay method. Doesn't that blow your mind? And yet in Italy, still 86% or so of personal transactions are done by cash. And to uh, try and mitigate and reduce tax evasion, who knew that was a problem in Italy, there are offers of tax cuts if you use plastic now. Heaven knows what they'll think about the idea of a microchip. The balloon on the picture is actually a weather balloon, which nods to climate change. But there are references as well from Tom about the threat of inflation and, and taxes. Could we see them both going up? That 
could be the next normal. And we really have not seen that for a very long time. So we have to be ready for that. They won't necessarily happen. They won't necessarily happen in tandem. They won't necessarily happen next week. But we've got to take account of that. And if there isn't inflation in the short term, certainly the Bank of England uh, on this conversation I was on last week uh, have a very wide fan as to the level of, of inflation. And their, their best guess is it's not ramping up rapidly, but it could do. But there is an acceleration, as they say, of the existing trends. We've spoken about these before. But the potential for significant unemployment means inflation, unless it's driven up maybe by wages or, or energy from oil costs, is probably a bit further off. Responsibility and accountability. Can you watch for these words more and more? Because I think they will come into uh, your investments and your investment choices. And you may be asked whether you want to take that approach. So if investing won't be the same again, Bob spoke about demographics. We know something about uh, global demographics. There are plenty of statistics now. Uh, we know something about the average age of our clients, for example. These could be typical clients in this picture from what we know. But what will their next normal look like? Healthcare is driven uh, by the pandemic to some extent, but only quicker than it was biotech and technology the same. We've alluded to that fact that we've crammed years into months. More digital access will be vital for people in whatever form, but there is an even greater demand, and we're already seeing this, for personal advice and support. So these two things are going to have to go hand in hand. Time, as I've alluded to already, has always been a finite commodity. That's become more valuable, not less. So understanding the demographics, understanding what young people are wanting, what the retired people are wanting, what some of these people who are now working from home and have a completely different environment, a completely different time frame to their working day, what will they require? This is all pretty vital stuff. So be prepared for some change. There is more socially responsible investing around already. Uh, we're seeing a lot more around sustainability and responsibility generally. But look out for this word accountability. I really do think it's important. We've got to be ready, and we are, to respond to deflation and or uh, inflation. Historically, I've advised clients for many years. Uh, clients have said one of their biggest worries is, is inflation, keeping pace with inflation, and, and quite right too. What do we have to worry about if we're going into no inflation or even a deflationary environment? Uh, sectors on the up, technology and healthcare, which we've covered in two of our last three uh, webinars prior to this one. Sectors under, under pressure or in difficulty, uh, traditional energy, airlines and hospitality sectors. And yet even within the latter, or in fact, all of those, there are opportunities. Maybe hydrogen in energy we haven't spoken about today might be interesting. Private chartered airlines and certain areas of the hospitality sector could adapt better to social distancing than the historical ones. Maybe hotels could be an interesting area. I want you want to point you to the quote from Gandhi. I'll let you read it for yourselves. But it seems to me that for a man who was talking uh, comfortably more than uh, 70 years ago, uh, this could easily have been said around where we are today. Uh, we do need to think a lot about change and it is accelerating. So what is the next normal? Uh, today's been about investment opportunities. Uh, we've consistently delivered strong performance for our clients and confident we'll continue to do so. And consistency doesn't happen by accident. It happens because we're thoughtful, because we plan, because we execute and because we review what we do. We don't wallow in nostalgia and we know our next decision will be every bit as important as the last one that we made. We do have to take a nod from history, but we are looking forward. This is true of the asset management team, just as it is the rest of the business. Even in lockdown and the current new normal, we're looking for the next normal. Consultants are still helping clients plan for their retirements, uh, whether they be imminent or, or 30 years hence. And during this period, we've been celebrating with clients just as we've had to commiserate to. Uh, and I send my commiserations to Jane's family uh, Jane passed away yesterday. Our best selling product is peace of mind. It always was and it always will be. To us, understanding the next normal is important. 
we continue to mix old fashioned values and virtues with innovation. So here's to the next normal. Back to you, Joe. Thanks so much, Simon. And uh, thank you to our audience as well today, because it is quite a warm afternoon. So I hope that you're um, in cooler environments than I am. And if I could just invite uh, the, the rest of the speaker team back onto camera. So we've got uh, Bob and Tom because we do have a couple of questions that have been raised by our audience this afternoon that I would uh, love you to kind of respond to. Just a reminder to our audience members that there will be a recording of today's webinar and we will circulate that to you along with the answers to questions that have been submitted today. So if we can start off, uh, I think if I can come to Tom, first of all, we've got a couple of questions, Tom, around uh, technology. So uh, thank you to Adam and Jackie and Cash for raising questions around this. So Tom, with the NASDAQ performing strongly since the start of the pandemic, does the team see continued growth in the technology sector? And what effect does the team think that a possible change of presidency later this year would have on technology stocks? Well, the quick answer is yes, we do see continued opportunity there, um, partly for the reasons I've given, but and just summarize those. It is because the what we consider tech is growing. It's, it's broadening. Who would have thought cars would be in that sector, as I've just described with driverless cars? So it, it's an opportunity that is con continually evolving. And... Uh, you may think that a threat is Biden coming in as president, because if Democrats win both houses of Congress, which it looks like they might, then undoubtedly there will be a strong move that, that may well be successful to break up some of the techs. And you think, well, won't that decrease valuations? Because, of course, Facebook, Amazon will no longer be able to get monopoly profits. Of course, Amazon is not a monopoly, in as, as, uh, as we've heard from the company, but in effect it is. And you think surely that would decrease share prices? Not at all, because if you break up monopolies, you create more competition. You create more uh, more competition means better better experiences for the consumer and more money spent on tech and more innovation. If you don't have large companies stifling small ones by buying them out, so uh, we are we are long term positive. Now there is a near term fear overvaluation. Um, the China spat, which I think is a near term. Believe me, the interlocking of China and US tech is so complicated. I think it would take more than Trump over the next three months to destroy that. For instance, Apple makes all of its gear in China and 20% of its sales come from China and Taiwan. So Apple would be severely hit if suddenly there was a wall between the two. So I think that that fear is overdone. But um, you know, near term, I quite understand nervousness over politics, over Trump, China, everything like that. Long term, it's it's an investable universe that just keeps on giving. That that's our view. Thank Joe, I, I really quickly add to that, if I may, just thirty seconds. But uh, the question and Tom's answer quite rightly uh, concentrate on what we see as tech. Uh, Amazon's not in the technology sector, and technology is is vital because it is now vital to all sectors. So technology is much more than simply the microchip, the semiconductor. Uh, producers and the iPhone producers in the form of Apple. Uh, it's a very, very wide piece now which affects uh, and, and will uh, only allow successful companies. Thanks, Simon. Tom, if I can remain with you, uh, I've got another question. Do you, This is from Neil, so thank you, Neil. Uh, do you believe money will need to be backed by a physical element, e.g. gold, silver, or other precious metals in the future, given we are printing so much? Uh, no, it doesn't. Money it has and always will be just about trust. Trust that there won't be too much being created. Uh, and we know that because since 1971, when Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard, we've all been floating in a world of fiat money based on nothing real, and it's worked. So uh, I, I think what we will see is the, uh, the currencies that do not engage in oversupply uh, uh ending up being the strongest ones 
Yeah, yeah, that would certainly be traditional monetary theory. And uh, the, the usual characters would turn up. You know, the Swiss have always been very good on their money supply. However, uh, a spanner in the works is Japan, which has shown that you can produce an awful lot of central bank money, funny money, and not create inflation and keep a relatively hard currency. So monetary economics is a very, very interesting point at the moment because the traditional ways in which we used to ascertain whether a currency would strengthen or weaken uh, over the last 10 years regarding Japan have been challenged. Thanks, Tom. Bob, well, if I could uh, raise this question with yourself next, it's from Steve. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so Steve says, I'm interested in this area of trends. Bob, you've had a long career. Uh, do you really feel investors can benefit from putting their money behind climate change trends or will it prove to be a fad? Uh, firstly, thank you, Steve. Um, a, a fair challenge, but I'm absolutely convinced this is this is going to be the, the way forward. I think the um, it's it's almost a, bit, a little bit like the pandemic. In early March, there was only a few cases and some people wondered whether there was a real issue to worry about at all. But of course, um, we, 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 we can now see very, very clearly that, that there was. And I think similarly with um, sustainability, responsible investment, it's coming for very, very good reasons. And I think it's now taken root to a degree that it's almost unstoppable. And I could give you lots of examples. For example, um, Boris Johnson, he's got his getting building fund to try to kickstart the economy. And I know for a fact that uh, in order to get a slice of that money, you have to tick boxes that your proposition will help move towards the circular economy as well as create employment. The government are uh, passing legislation called the plastic packaging tax, which means that by I think 2022, uh, certain manufacturers of plastic goods will have to use at least 30% recycled plastic. We obviously all know about the sort of the phasing out of hydrocarbons. And you can see just ginormous amounts of investment being put into green energy. Uh, investment institutions, many investment institutions are increasingly sort of uh, looking very carefully at the green credentials of the companies they're considering investing in and won't unless they tick the boxes. And I think you've also got a, a demographic issue here again. Um, the young are obviously very, very exercised about this. And um, as the years pass, they're going to get older and they're going to become much more influential as voters. So I do believe that uh, um, it's, it's, now, um, it's now taken root sufficiently that it, will, that it is unstoppable. What we're also seeing is that performance differentials between, say, a green portfolio and a tra traditional historic conventional portfolio, there used to be a sort of a significant um, gap. There was an underperformance in, in green uh, investments. That's not really the case anymore. There's very, very little evidence that there's a loss by investing in green investment. And I think the, uh, <clears throat> I think the opportunities for... Um, uh, re-engineering business processes to create new business opportunities will create some very, very dynamic businesses in the future as they displace the existing um, non-green businesses. We are literally into the last minute, so I'm going to have to draw uh, today's webinar to a close. I apologise for those that did post some questions that we've just run out of time to address, but please be assured that we will uh, circulate round that question and answer sheet to you post today and as it shows on the screen please make a note of those two upcoming webinar dates we would love to see you join us again and uh, thank you very much